Okay, a breather show by request for what I eat in a typical day. Now, I've done lengthy presentations on this, so I'm going to just give you the quick overview, and it's not terribly exciting. There's not a tremendous amount of variety, but I've locked into a pattern that works for me, but always subject to revision, experimentation, and especially, as I've noted on many episodes, uh, my 2022 experiment to make a deliberate attempt to fast less frequently, consume more total calories, and especially consume more nutritious carbohydrate calories inspired by my shows with Jay Feldman, Energy Balance, and the idea that as a healthy, active person striving for peak performance goals, I don't want to introduce additional stressors that fasting and adhering to ketogenic macronutrient profiles can represent especially when I'm trying to combine them with high intensity workouts, being in the older age group and trying to recover. So I'm focused now on performing and recovering and performing and recovering and striving for maximum cellular energy status at all times. So my historical eating pattern has changed dramatically from the typical pattern for maybe the previous uh, 15 years of spending the morning hours typically in a fasted state or nibbling on dark chocolate or something until midday. And then I'd go and enjoy a delicious uh, centerpiece meal. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, the rest of the day, another a nutritious dinner and so forth, kind of the two meals a day pattern. But now I make a concerted effort as soon as I finish my 40 minute morning exercise routine to fuel myself with nutritious calories. And that is typically a big bowl of fruit, an assortment of different fruits, tropical fruits, berries. I love pomegranates and I will consume a nice bowl of fruit in the morning after my morning exercise session, in addition to a awesome B-Rad super fuel high protein smoothie. And I throw a bunch of other stuff in there besides two to two and a half scoops of the new whey protein super fuel. I also will add a little bit of extra creatine and extra glutamine, a whole bunch of capsules from ancestral supplements, especially my MoFo organ supplement. And I'm also experimenting with uh, numerous other supplements right now, thanks to my personal consultation with Merrick Health. So go over to that link right now and learn what that program is all about. It's MerrickHealth.com slash Brad. And you can see the recommended blood test that I have uh, gone through and had that expert consultation uh, coming with an assortment of supplement recommendations that I'm now throwing in my smoothie every morning. Just for me, a great way to ensure adherence that I'm taking all this stuff that I'm testing out and going through. So that morning smoothie has the uh, base of either bone broth or raw milk fresh from the, uh, the co-op market. So that's my liquid base. And then I'll put in uh, plenty of frozen fruit, uh, starting with frozen bananas, maybe adding some berries, mangoes, different things that I'll pick up at the store. And those are in a frozen state. So those act like the ice cubes. So I have the liquid base. I have the smoothie powder, the, the B-Rad Super Fuel Whey Protein. I have uh, frozen fruit. I have a bunch of capsules. And then I will also throw a few chunks of frozen raw liver into the smoothie. And if I put enough fruit in, it will kind of mask the taste for the most part of that liver. But I'm trying to up my liver game and find a way to get it into my uh, daily intake. So that huge smoothie and that huge bowl of fruit leaves me fully fueled uh, for a productive uh, hours ahead. And I'll still be nibbling on the dark chocolate uh, throughout the day, including the morning hours right after I have this wonderful nutrition. And then uh, at some point, we'll have a, a midday or an afternoon meal. And my favorite there is uh, to fry up some corn tortillas in gourmet olive oil and make a bunch of eggs or perhaps a skirt steak or perhaps ground beef or ground bison from butcher box and so i'll put that onto the corn tortillas and enjoy that typically with sliced avocado and some sauce like cholula sauce and so you're looking at a nice little miniature uh, presentation on each corn tortilla with a bunch of ground beef or steak chopped up and then uh, slices of avocado so that's my typical midday meal 
Um, I'm drinking a lot of mineral water. I like the sparkling mineral water like Pellegrino or Gerol Steiner, which I get by the case at Trader Joe's and I definitely load up. And I know it's a lot of glass and a lot of recycling, uh, but it's a great way to add back um, the minerals that we are sincerely deficient in in the modern diet due to the depletion of the soil. So I'm getting my magnesium, potassium. Of course, I'm also throwing in uh, the LMNT packet. So I'm getting my electrolyte status uh, really strong throughout the day, especially on the heels of a strenuous workout. That's when I really try to focus on uh, refueling and balancing my electrolytes with a drink. So I'll have uh, the LMNT flavors, or I'll throw in uh, some of my homemade kombucha with that sparkling mineral water and be sipping on that in a huge container throughout the day. Um, I talked about my lunch with the fried corn tortillas. Sometimes uh, this gourmet sourdough bread that we find from certain local bakeries, that will be the thing I fry in the pan with the olive oil. So I have this nice sourdough toast that I will put the ground beef on or the steak and the avocado. And dinner is really uh, something similar. And it's usually a uh, butcher box special. Uh, I have a lot of ribeye, I have a lot of ground beef, and then I love to go and get skirt steak or flap steak, perhaps from a big box store like Costco, or perhaps from Whole Foods, I'll get the uh, grass-fed, pasture-raised. Um, but most part, I'm trying to source uh, the best sources of beef, and sometimes I will slip and get conventional, but I'm really focused on red meat uh, and now have uh, made a devoted effort to minimize my consumption of uh, mainstream, especially sources of chicken and pork, because they have a vastly inferior fatty acid profile. The animal is raised in inferior conditions to red meat, and red meat being a ruminant animal, so we not only cattle, uh, but bison, buffalo, and lamb, and other sources of red meat have a superior fatty acid and nutritional profile, even if they've been raised conventionally. So number one goal is grass-fed red meat, and if I can find organic pasture-raised chicken, I will allow that. But otherwise, I'm staying away from conventional chicken and pork due to the concerns about how the animals are raised and the nutritional profile of the end product. So it's a really red meat-focused diet, and that's what dinner is going to be most of the time. Um, I will make the effort to uh, get some sweet potatoes in there or squash. And there's not a ton of variety to my dinner meal uh, when making it at home. And now I'm going to go to um, the next category would be a little less frequent. So things like dining out uh, and some of the things that are uh, not part of that daily template. Um, so I'll enjoy things like uh, squash soup, especially in the wintertime, uh, wild caught salmon when I'm going into the fish category, which is uh, less frequently these days. Uh, also inspired by the concerns that have been communicated about the pollution in the waters and the sustainability, and especially the sourcing, for example, farm-raised salmon, which represents 90% of what's out there on the marketplace, and almost entirely the selection that you get at any restaurant, unless stated otherwise, that they're serving wild-caught salmon, very expensive. Um, farm-raised salmon has a bunch of objections because of the, the, the prevalence and the overcrowding and some of the, some of the farming uh, adverse conditions. And so I'm trying to go for wild caught salmon as my main source of fish. Uh, I also enjoy dining out at quality sushi restaurants and enjoying the many uh, marine life that they offer there. Or Fresh Mex is another favorite for dining out and trying to source the best places. And some of them are the the uh, the, the, the truck uh, on the street corner that sets up shop every afternoon and they're making the stuff right there. And I'm always trying to find the organ meat. So my favorites are cabeza and buche and, uh, uh, and, and lengua. So lengua is tongue, cabeza is head or brain, and the buche is... Uh, or the, the tripe is coming from the intestines. So uh, finding ways to get that organ meat in my diet, especially enjoy that at Fresh, fresh Mex. I also occasionally make, for example, a huge crock pot stew uh, with the centerpiece meat being um, a tongue or being oxtail. Uh, so you get those from the butcher and you put it in there for eight hours and it's absolutely fantastic. I will also slice up things like carrots, onions and sweet potatoes for flavor and that stew will last for several days uh, with the centerpiece meat being oxtail and tongue also great sources of uh, nutrition and being in that superior organ meat category so if i'm referencing my own carnivore scores food rankings chart 
I'm doing pretty well to prioritize things on that chart. I mentioned the eggs that I'll have at midday, and that'll be four or five or sometimes even six eggs, uh, trying to maximize my consumption of the best foods on the planet, um, especially when you can go get pasture-raised eggs prevalent in most grocery stores across the country now. So it's really nice to see that distribution increasing. Um, so this is in the less frequent category when I talk about things like squash soup or wild-caught salmon, dining out for sushi or fresh mex, making those crockpot stews. Um, if I need some energy away from meals, if I'm running around, of course, I'll take a spoonful of Brad's macadamia masterpiece, and that'll keep me going for a long time. So basically, my snacks, not a ton of snacking, except for enjoying that dark chocolate uh, as much as possible. I surround myself with it in my office. <laughs> I bring it in my pack and I'm you know, I'm always uh, able to reach for some dark chocolate. And that kind of keeps me in check because you can only eat so much chocolate every day. I do eat a ton of it, but if those are my indulgences, uh, macadamia masterpiece, dark chocolate, I'm not going crazy with a bunch of stuff. Oh, but I should also mention uh, dried fruit, also inspired by Jay Feldman. So when I do need some quick uh, energy and a quick strategy to turn down stress hormones first thing in the morning, for example, I will grab a few pieces of dried fruit. Horrors. I can't believe it. I haven't touched this stuff for years um, following all the, uh, the, the the protocol and the party line for ancestral health that this is so full of sugar and all that. But at times, because I'm leading a healthy, active lifestyle and performing and recovering and needing that energy to uh, sustain my performance and my recovery from workouts, I have no problem chowing down a few pieces of dried fruit pretty much every morning before I commence my 40-minute exercise routine. And then afterward, I'll take the time to prepare the bowl of fruit and the protein smoothie. And that's kind of a nice reward for yet again, another day in the books, finishing that ambitious 40-minute exercise routine that you can learn all about when you enroll in the morning routine course that you can see on bradkearns.com. So that was the less frequent category. And then I'll say very infrequent category is driving across town and enjoying some gourmet ice cream from a really nice quality handmade ice cream shop. Um, it's a great treat. And I do mention driving across town to emphasize that point. That there's a huge difference between enjoying life and getting a wonderful, fabulous treat that you have to drive across town for versus buying those pints and having it on your grocery list and having ready-made access to uh, foods that don't have a ton of nutritional value and can easily lead down a slipper, slippery slope to excess consumption. Similarly, dining out, had a great Italian meal down in Arizona last month. And what did I order from the vast menu where I certainly could have picked and choose and made myself a paleo-friendly Italian meal? I'm like, you know what? That pumpkin ravioli sounds pretty good. So I'm sure I had a massive carb fest there. But again, performance, recovery, carbs are not evil, even if they're in that uh, you know processed form when you're having some nice homemade ravioli from a quality Italian restaurant, it's okay, gonna burn it off the next day or burn it off the previous day. So I think we have to expand our perspective, especially when we demonize something like fruit or a bowl of fruit as uh, taking you off track from your wonderful paleo or keto goals. We want to perform and recover and be active and so I'm doing everything I can to avoid the stress of stacking things like challenging exercise with uh, prolonged periods of fasting or minimizing intake of all carbs in the keto framework. Again, these are uh, great tools to use, uh, such as fasting and keto for the widely uh, uh, validated health benefits, but not every day when it's paired with uh, a difficult, challenging workout at the gym and also the importance of enjoying life and enjoying those indulgences when they are well-chosen, uh, well-deserved, and you enjoy the heck out of every moment. So I really enjoyed my pumpkin ravioli. I don't know when I'll order that next. Maybe when I go back to the same restaurant on another vacation. Okay, you get me here? I hope so, thank you. Um, and now I would uh, end with what's in the uh, quote unquote virtually absent category. And notably, this would be salads, stir fries, and green smoothies. And so this has been since early 2019. I haven't had a bite of salad. I can't even look at it. I have no desire for it because I've become convinced that it does not have to be the centerpiece of a healthy diet. And in fact, as we refer to the Carnivore Scores food rankings chart, 
We're going to try to emphasize the true superfoods of the planet that contain the most nutrition, things like grass-fed red meat, grass-fed organ meats, uh, the, the salmon eggs, the oysters, uh, the, the, the pasture-raised eggs, and the salad would be something that you would consume because you enjoy it, uh, or you're loading up a ton of delicious steak on top. That's my mentality shift and my lifelong shift in my dietary habits. Same category for stir-fry. Uh, to the great confusion of my family because I was the champ at making these wonderful, colorful stir fries and serving them at uh, meals that we gather to. And now it's like, eh, no, I don't really want any vegetables <laughs> anymore in any of my meals. And this, of course, is due to concerns about the potential uh, reactivity to the natural plant toxins and also the lack of necessity as a dietary centerpiece. So look, if you want to cook up your favorite uh, greens and have that as a something that you enjoy every day with a little uh, flecks of garlic and a lot of butter on your uh, cooked spinach. When you cook the, uh, the, the, the plant, it's going to vastly neutralize the potential adverse effects of consuming this stuff raw. But then in the next category, when I talk about my green smoothies, um, you've heard me mention this before, boy, that was a kick I was on for a very short time where I'd put a massive dose of raw kale, raw spinach, raw carrots, raw beets, raw celery, and stuff them into my big smoothie and drink down these giant uh, pitchers of, of green stuff in the name of health. But every time uh, it caused an immediate and acute digestive distress. So my stomach would pop out and I'd be walking around with a big bloated belly for several hours after consuming my green smoothie in the name of health. So that was a wonderful recalibration to realize that it was, I was consuming of course, a bunch of nutrition, and you can read an article about how nutritious a green smoothie is, but I was also consuming a concentrated dose of very potent plant toxins in their most raw form among the most offensive foods in the plant kingdom, uh, which would be the leafy greens. So that stuff is virtually, that is entirely absent, the salads, the stir fries, and the green smoothie. And then uh, also I would say entirely absent are uh, processed snacks and treats things that are poor quality, uh, including uh, virtually all energy bars, because most of them are uh, kind of offensive, even if they're uh, a little bit better than uh, the mainstream. Uh, they just rather not consume a processed product. I'd rather have something uh, that was natural and wholesome instead, such as a spoonful of macadamia masterpiece, right? So I'm not looking at uh, wrappers and uh, frozen items and little treats. I, I tried those keto ice creams for a while, a couple, few years ago. Hey, they're keto. Why not to have some of that? But again, we're talking about a processed food with minimal nutritional value and potential concerns about digestibility and interfering with your own natural cellular energy production. So when I have a treat, it's really well chosen. It's natural. It's handmade, whatever category you want to call it. Um, same with the gourmet bean to bar dark chocolate. I'm sourcing the best stuff from around the world. So I'm not reaching for a snicker bar when I'm hungry. I'm looking at times when there's a lack of available food as great opportunities for fasting rather than cow towing to whatever's available in the convenience store when you're on a long trip. So that's the uh, the last category and the go-to pieces. You can look for them right on the uh, Carnivore Scores food rankings chart. So please download that colorful chart. We work so hard on that. It's a great centerpiece to put on your refrigerator and help give you this perspective of emphasizing the world's most nutritious foods and enjoying yourself every day. Thanks a lot.